So the big question is this, why well-being conscious women just like us who want to live a healthy and happy life are constantly feeling vulnerable like, what if I get attacked? And so many people who teach self-defense are tough men or martial artists who don't seem to understand what women really go through every day. How can feel safer and be more confident in our personal safety? That is the question and this channel gives you the answer. My name is Kinko Hamilton and welcome to Rise Up Against Violence. Hi ladies, today I'd love to introduce you Sarah Marie Baumgartner. She is an affiliate instructor of Pretty Loaded by Beth Warfer. She was one of the awesome speakers at the Women's Self-Defense Summit in 2020. Also, Sarah Marie is a CEO and founder of MAPS Project Defense. I came to know her through the Women's Self-Defense Summit and I'm having this show, I'm filming this show because I just realized that there is a huge gap between the mainstream self-defense and uh, women's self-defense. And yeah, people say, well, there's no self difference between you know self-defense and women's self-defense. There is. And as much as men don't want to recognize that, we women recognize it. That's why I wanted to have this show. And Sarah Marie, today's guest speaker strongly resonated with my idea. So such a pleasure to have you, Sarah Marie. Welcome. Thank you. It's awesome to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you and to talk about this subject that's really become a big part of my life and um, a passion. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. So Sarah Marie, tell us why this is such a big and important part in self-defense. Sure. So um, yeah, just to kind of recognize the difference. Um, my background is, um, and one of the things that I'll share too, is that I'm also a domestic violence um, survivor. I am a cancer survivor as well. And so I really didn't get into um, martial arts and self-defense until I had left my abusive um, marriage. Uh, I was, I've been, an, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 14 years. And so I think a lot of my situational awareness was definitely medical based in recognizing changes you know, in patients and how to help them. And then as I started studying martial arts um, here in Colorado Springs at the U.S. Taekwondo Center um, and training self-defense, I realized how a lot of like what I was doing in nursing could translate to martial arts and self-defense. And now over, um, I left that um, relationship in 2016. I actually was assaulted um, in December of 2019, um, or I'm sorry, December 29th, 2016. So roughly about seven months after I started training martial arts and self-defense and I used it, I had to use it. I was bear hugged from behind and my daughter was in the car. We were actually at the parking lot of her um, counselor. <laughs> um, she was going for a therapy appointment and I had to use self-defense. Um, and so I think one of the big differences that maybe really isn't really understood, and I'd love to share some information and data with you because that's what I do <laughs> as a nurse as well. So um, there's a 2018 study by the UNODC um, really showing that male perpetrators and male victims of homicide um, make up for 80% worldwide. So out of all the homicides in the world, 80% of those are um, committed towards men, by men. Um, so gang related, you know, other things like that. So that means, you know, for, for women, it only makes up 20% of the violence worldwide. However, if you look at intimate personal violence relationships or domestic violence relationships, women make up 82% of the death in those relationships. So we really have to look at the correlation here of mainstream self-defense is really kind of for men. I mean, they're 80% of the victims and we're a smaller 20% of the victims. However, when it comes to, you know, date rape and those interpersonal relationships, we make up 82% of those victims. And it's a, it's a different approach, you know, it's in mainstream, we teach 
um, you know, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. And we also teach, you know, stay away from fringe areas. So when you're walking on the street, you know, there's a dark alley, go around, you know, don't get close to the alley. Well, where's the alley when it's the person that you're sleeping next to every night? Where's those fringe areas? How do I protect myself and be proactive when it's a person that I'm in a relationship with that might be living in my home? Um, and so I think that that's, that's where there's a little bit of a disconnect. And that's why I created MAPS Project Defense. And so MAPS actually stands for Mindful, Able, Prepared, Safe. That's amazing, Sarah Marie. And that's exactly why self-defense programs specifically created for women by the woman is so important. And tell us, Sarah Marie, about your MAPS program, please. You just share with us what those uh, letters are, but like what exactly uh, is MAPS program and how does it help women? Yeah, so the MAPS Project um, Defense is a trauma-informed program, and so that's where it's different than mainstream as well. And so it, I'm really working with victims and survivors of domestic violence, and so there has to be a component of understanding how trauma affects the body, how trauma changes the way you perceive things, how trauma changes the way you act on things. And so in order to effectively teach a woman to protect herself, you have to kind of go through the trauma a little bit. Um, I am in no way like a replacement for counseling or therapy or an advocate or your domestic violence shelters. Like I really see MAPS Project Defense as an adjunct. We are a complement to those things. And so you really need those things as well. Um, I just focus on the what can we do to help you feel empowered to physically protect yourself, but I have to approach it in a little bit of a different way. And so, um, you know, there's breathing exercises. We've seen study after study, um, you know, in the last few years that breathing helps calm down that vagal nerve. It helps calm down that sympathetic response, which is what happens, fight, flight, or freeze. Um, and so it's about, really learning how to care for your body in that way so that when you're in a physical altercation you can turn off all the distractions and be planned and be prepared and find your safety mm -hmm. so trauma-informed self-defense in the summit uh, women's self-defense summit in 2020 arizona brody talked about trauma-informed self-defense and she mentioned that women who take self-defense classes are usually because they, or inclu instructors included, because they have been the uh, victims of the assault. You mentioned that trauma, so mindfulness, introduced mindfulness to the self-defense program, but what other aspects uh, are in trauma-informed self-defense? Um, so I think it's just really just understanding, um, you know, what the the person is going through. So it's it's the it's really the instructor having an understanding of of what they're dealing with um, as far as cues to look for if somebody's being triggered with trauma, um, and then teaching those. Um, teaching the students what to do and how to deal with trauma as well. So, so other techniques to teach is not just the breath, but also what's called grounding exercises. And so when you're triggered and you have trauma going on, um, you know, if you have a response to that and you're being, um, you know, triggered into that fight, flight, or freeze mode, you start getting the tunnel vision. You know, we teach about that stuff in the mainstream. Um, how do you get out of that so that you can, um, you know, deal with the situation in front of you? And so one of the techniques um, also that we teach is grounding. And so grounding is, um, you know, what is something that you can focus on? What is something that you can use to kind of pull yourself out of that triggered response? And mm -hmm. so there's things that, you know, there's like splashing cold water on your face, those types of things. Sometimes that's not always plausible or feasible, um, but there's other things that you can do and it's like okay what are five things that I'm seeing right now what are four things that I'm hearing right now mm -hmm. what are two things that I'm smelling right now and so it's learning techniques that help kind of yank you out of that 
that trigger so that you can focus on what's going on. So that's that's another um, aspect of the trauma-informed self-defense. And it's also teaching, teaching the students themselves of what's going on inside their body. You know, a lot of um, victims, they have uh, what's called trauma bonding. And so trauma bonding is where you can't imagine that you've had to left, leave this person. This person is abusive to you and you feel this incredible like tug to go back to them. Um, another term for it is Stockholm syndrome. So like uh, prisoners that were in like concentration camps and things like that and how they sympathize with these people that kept them in concentration camps. And so, you know, when you're trauma bonded with somebody, you have to get over even that mental barrier to be able to protect yourself. You don't wanna hurt that person. It's somebody that you loved. It's somebody that you've been in a relationship. It's somebody that you may have kids with. Um, and so there's just a lot to overcome when it comes to learning how to defend yourself because you know if I'm just running down the trail and it's a random person that I don't know that's just attacked me, there's more inclination to, I gotta do whatever I can to protect this person or to fight this person off. Whereas, you know, if it's your partner, there's other considerations. Like if I hit back and then the police show up, he can say I abused that him, you know? And so there's a lot more that goes into it um, than just being able to teach a woman to fight off the attacker that's, that's attacked them on the running trail or in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I hear about uh, domestic abuse is that, you know, just tell women who have been victimized, just leave, drop everything and leave. Is that something that realistic thing or um, a realistic advice to do so? Or what would you say to that? Um, no, so it's not, it's not realistic um, advice to say, just leave. And so um, there's kind of a turn, there's a, there's a saying that, oh, go ahead. I hear this. I mean, if you ask men, right, or if you're so used to watch uh, major street, mainstream YouTube channel or the uh, self-defense classes, those combative sports, you know, you, you, somebody's abuse, you just leave, right? Like just the men tell women in a self-defense class, just leave, drop everything and leave. So um, yeah, it's not that, it's not that simple, bro. Um, no. <laughs> sorry, Marie, please take it away. Sure. Yeah, no, it's not that simple. Um, one, you know, it's somebody that you've had a relationship with. You started off loving this person. You have a bond with this person. Um, so, you know, that bond needs to be broken. Um, it's the same as with the trauma bonding, like I was talking about. There, there's, It's proven study after study that abusers use a cycle of abuse that causes a victim to become bonded to them. And so you have to break that. There's there's money. So a lot of these victims are being financially abused. They don't have jobs. They don't have access to money. You can't just up and leave when you don't have anywhere to go, especially if you have children. Um, the other thing too is like abusers will threaten, if you ever leave me, I will kill you. And so you get it in your brain that I have to stay and that's the only way to stay alive is to stay because if I try to leave, he said he was going to kill me. Um, and so it's not, it's not that easy to just leave. Um, statistically, uh, victims try seven times to leave before they are um, successful at, at leaving a relationship. I myself called the police twice um, and then it was the third time that I finally was able to get out. Um, in my situation, I managed to continue to work as a nurse. So I had income. So it was a little bit easier for me because I did have that income. Um, but there's so many women that, that don't have the income and they don't have access to the money. So what are, for those women, what are the first steps or uh, first few steps that you encourage them to do? Yeah, so the first steps um, I encourage women to do um, is really 
when you're ready, um, you can call, there's the National Domestic Violence Hotline. So definitely call them because they have advocates that are there and ready to support and help you and to find resources in your area. Um, I did seek out those resources and um, you know, it wasn't as helpful for me because I did have an income and a lot of those resources are for lower income. And so it was a little bit more difficult for me to find the help. So the second piece of advice I would give is that when it becomes difficult to find help, keep looking because it's there. Like don't give up. There are advocates, there are people. So I'm also a volunteer for um, an organization called Break the Silence Against Domestic Violence. And um, we have a helpline which is a little bit different than a hotline. A hotline is um, has advocates and they're there for really like crisis. The helpline we're there for um, maybe, you know, if you're not in immediate crisis, but you need connection with resources, um, you can call the Break the Silence Against Domestic Violence helpline. Um, it's a social media based organization that is really just focused on um, education and bringing awareness around domestic violence. And then also how to, thrive after you've gotten out of your situation. But there's, there's a lot of good um, blog articles um, that uh, help bring awareness to the situation. So when you feel like you're getting ready, one, like get educated, um, join Facebook groups. There's domestic, sh uh, domestic violence shelter.org. BTS ADV has a um, Facebook group. And so there's a lot of good Facebook groups that you can join as well. Um, and then get creative. So for those people like that, you know, maybe your email is monitored or your phone is monitored and you don't have access to those ways electronically, get creative. Talk to your primary care doctor, make an appointment to see your primary care doctor and say, hey, I need help getting out. Can you help you know, get resources in here for me. Um, Cause I know as a nurse, like that was one of the things that we worked as a multidisciplinary team. You know, you had your case manager, your social worker, your respiratory therapist, the doctor, you had a team. And so the medical field um, is really, you know, they, they can coordinate those resources for you as well mm. in trying to help you make those connections to get out. So if, if you're more locked down, so to speak in a way where you don't have access to things, get creative get creative. And I mean, there's a video out there of a woman that, you know, she convinced her boyfriend to take her dog to the vet. And, you know, she wrote a note and gave it to the, to the vet tech. And so yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. Get creative. Don't give up because there are people there that are 100% there for you and wanting to help. Hmm. So everybody, I have a question. In one of the Instagram posts regarding domestic abuse, I saw that um, have a, like a create a code that you are in danger. So like when you're talking to your mom or friends, like do some like hand gesture or something that you, your spouse or partner can't see, but the the person you're talking to, or let's say. Yeah, you know, I'm going to have a pizza tonight, for example, that's a cold word kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, is that a good thing to do? And when I am the re receiver and what would I do? Do I, do I call police or do I show up to their house? Or like, what are the uh, safer way to protect the victims? Right. So in the case of using um, a code like that, and thank you for asking that question, because that's that's really, really important. Um, there are some other things I saw posted on my Facebook feed where, you know, it was, you know, send me a message and ask me if I have mascara in stock or something like that. Um, and then I'll know that you need help. And so those safe words are really, um, really important. And they usually indicate like immediate danger. So I would not recommend the person that is on the receiving end of that message go to the person's house, um, you definitely want to call um, emergency services and have them respond to the situation. Um, as far as like, you know, maybe if you 
if the person's far away, like if, if, if you're a mother and it's your daughter and there's grandchildren involved, um, you may want to go and be closer in the vicinity, um, but not to show up until you know that emergency services are there. Um, so really they need to, um, police officers, they need to secure the scene, so to speak. I'm gonna speak <laughs> lingo there, but they really need to secure the situation um, beforehand. And that's, that's something that happened to me um, um, I didn't have anybody that could come and help me, but the second time that I called police, um, you know, I didn't have a bag packed and ready to go. Mm. Um, so that is definitely like another thing that I would recommend is having a bag packed and ready to go. And so in that bag, you have, you know, a change of clothes, your toiletries, any medications that you need for you or your children, any important documents, um, social security cards, birth certificates, that kind of stuff, um, money, if you have it, um, put that all in that bag and have that ready to go. Because what happened to me was things escalated and I didn't have that ready. And I was in the process of packing it, putting it in my car. Um, I didn't take my children out of the house with me and my ex locked me out of the house with my children inside. And so then I was calling um, the police and they showed up, took 10 minutes to get there. I mean, it, 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 takes time they can't show up <laughs> in 90 seconds 30 right. seconds as much as we wish they could um and so once they showed up um once they showed up um you know we were able to go inside and at that time too i had become pretty sophisticated and so this is where i started planning my escape and i started recording my abuser so that when police showed up um, when I had to be in court and in the state of Colorado, you want to check your state laws because in the state of Colorado, um, you don't need to let the other person know that you're recording them. Mm -hmm. In some states, you do have to have both party consent. Right. Um, and so that's what I did. I had a recording of him. And when the police showed up, I played it and they could hear him threaten that he was going to kill me. Um, they didn't arrest him that night. I don't know why, <laughs> um, you know, it's, I understand it's their discretion, um, but they ultimately gave me what I wanted. And that was to leave with my children. And they kind of looked at me and said, what do you want? And I was like, I want my children. I want my belongings and I want to leave the house. And they stayed and they made sure that I got to safely leave the house. Sarah so, Marie, what would you suggest for those who live in a state that requires consent to videotape somebody or record somebody? Because I lived in Hawaii and one of my friends, girlfriends, was abused by her ex-husband, actually. Um, and they divorced and they're in actually custody battle. And he was a really brutal guy, very uh, aggressive guy. And he uh, he's also very manipulative. So he actually manipulated their situation and kind of put doubt and fear into their kids right so yeah. only people who those kids they had three kids uh the older one was a teenager but the small ones uh at the time i probably he's they're like eight and six so you know some the younger age right i would they only trusted me like they couldn't trust their dad obviously they couldn't trust their mom because kind of they're afraid and she wanted to record it but she couldn't because under the uh, Hawaii state law, she needed a consent of abuser to record things. Yeah, so in that situation, um, and that is where like the domestic violence shelters and the advocates, they can also help um, guide you on what some of the laws are. And so it, it may be that you can still record them. It's just right. not going to be admissible in court. Right. And so really in that instance, um, that's why talking to an advocate and talking to the shelter is really kind of the, the best um, thing to do because you can very honestly, I would very honestly go in and say, I'm not ready to leave yet but what are the steps that I can take to leave and what are, what's, what's the safest and what's the best way that I can document the abuse that's going on. And so the other part that comes with like the trauma informed and the mindfulness training that I do at MAPS Project Defense is it's also bringing an awareness to like what your feelings are. So, um, you know, in, when you're in an abusive relationship, you're taught your feelings don't matter what you think 
doesn't matter. And depending on how long in, you are in it, you lose the connection with yourself and you lose the connection with your feelings. And so one of the things that I really like to train is getting reconnected with those feelings. And so it helps to say, when he looked at me and he rose his hand up in the air, it made me feel unsafe. It made me feel scared. It made me feel like my life was in danger. And then, um, and so getting in touch with those feelings then help you to document the abuse much more clearly onto what is going on. And it helps you communicate with law enforcement too. So like, did he raise his hand? Was it open-handed or was it closed fisted? Um, you know, there's, there's different indications like an open hand is a slap and, you know, in self-defense, we kind of say, well, it was an open hand hit, you know, it, it was not too aggressive or too threatening, but it, if it was a closed hand fist. And so it's really becoming mindful as painful as it is, you have to be present in the pain and in the situation um, because that is one of the biggest things in, in how you can advocate for yourself is if you can really clearly explain the stuff that's going on. And so in your friend's case, like I would have suggested, you know, it suggested that and write down as like as much detail as you can, um, write it in a safe place. You know, a lot of phones, you can lock it, you can lock notes and you have to have like a password in order to get into the notes. Um, so if you have access to something like that, um, or even, like I said, get creative, make an appointment to go see your primary care doctor the next day, the following day or something like that. And tell them everything that happened. The sooner you can talk about it, um, the better. Um, something to keep in mind is that if um, there's strangulation or some other um, hitting involved, those bruises and that stuff take time to show up. Um, but definitely, you know, there's more and more evidence that suggests that anytime there's strangulation going on, there's trauma that's done to the brain and you really want to seek um, seek help, seek medical help as soon as possible. Um, when that, when that stuff occurs, if you can, I mean, obviously so your safety is the biggest, um, the biggest focus here and no one is in your shoes. No one knows the intimate in intricacies of what is going on within your relationship, except for you. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I like to teach self-advocacy and help empower victims to be their own advocate because no one's going to be able to advocate. No one's going to be able to understand your situation as well as you do. Mm -hmm. That is so true. And Sarah Marie, where can women start with trauma-informed self-defense? Is there a book you recommend or the video you recommend or, you know, anything that you recommend for women to start right now? Um, so there's a lot. I wish I had written them all down. Um, one of the things that, um, actually one of the books that I'm listening to now um, is The Body Keeps the Score. And so that is a wonderful book um, about trauma. It's very informative. Um, it's pretty, pretty in depth. So I don't know if I'd recommend it as necessarily like a beginner um, book, but definitely if you want to get dig deeper. Um, one of the books that I started with while I was still with my abuser that really helped me um, because I also had a lot of trauma, uh, childhood trauma. I was sexually assaulted when I was four years old, lived with a lot of shame like my whole life. And so one of the books that really, really helped me was um, Brene Brown, The Power of Vulnerability. And so I listened to that book while I was on um, on audio while I was still with my abuser. It was kind of how I hid that I was listening to this stuff. Um, and so that, that really made a difference because that really helped me face a lot of the stuff that was keeping me in the abusive relationship, which was the shame that I was living with, you know, like I felt like nobody would ever love me. I wasn't worthy. Um, you know, I would never be able to get anything right. And so I think that's another thing that keeps, um, people in abusive relationships that, um, is, is being talked about, but not enough. And that is shame. And I actually recently just did a training through, um, the Somatic Experience Institute and, um, they talked about how shame can actually present as trauma. And so, you don't talk and you get quiet and you shut down. And it's yeah. because the 
emotions that you're feeling surrounding the shame um, that you're feeling because of the situation that you're in. So, um, so yeah, the power of vulnerability, Brene Brown, the, um, the body keeps the score. Um, as far as like the trauma informed self defense training, I am in the process of finishing all of that up getting the videos and getting that program up and ready um, on my website to make it available. Um, and so it'll be available for um, anyone to find on their own, but then also we'll be networking with um, shelters and um, police around the world, hopefully, <laughs> um, in getting that program in their hands as well. And also doing some training with police and how they respond to a domestic violence situation. Um, it's really encouraging that they, that they are really focusing on doing that training for police officers, helping them become more trauma informed so that when they show up to a domestic violence situation, um, they can have a little bit of a better understanding of what's going on. Absolutely. I see that the world is becoming a little bit more accept, like accepting to the fact that there is domestic violence and a woman or man are suffering daily. Um, because back in the days, like 20, 30 years ago, I mean, yeah. nobody did anything <laughs> about it, right? Yeah. None but, of my business, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got punched in my face by my father. My father kicked my sister, younger sister, kicked off the stairs. I mean, obviously we didn't call police, but that's like, well, you made your dad angry. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's mm -hmm. different um, attitude back then. So, well, I really want to thank you, Sarah Marie, for sharing your story and sh sharing your experience and expertise and helping other women to, it's really about healing, isn't it? It's just trauma-informed self-defense is really about healing, helping them heal and finding their own voice and recovering their identity, refining their identity and to meet, you know, to really meet peace of mind that they were born with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's like the mainstream tra uh, trainings, you know, where the, it's the adrenaline rush and you're attacking the guy in the suit and, you know, doing all of that. And that's awesome. That's awesome training. But that's definitely not where somebody that's just experienced trauma, like really needs to start. Um, and so and that's why I really wanted to come up with this trauma informed um, practice um, and self defense is because it's, it's more of a starting point for people so that they can work up to doing that high adrenaline, um, you know, stuff. And it, my vision is that it helps them get there faster. You know, like there might be a time where like somebody who is in trauma could eventually take that class, but it might take them longer when they haven't learned to, you know, handle their trauma and go through all of that. And so, um, so yeah, I think it's just a little bit of a different approach. Um, you know, one in four women experience domestic violence, one in 12 men experience domestic violence in their lifetime. And so that's, that's a pretty high number. Um, yeah. And those are only the, have. yeah. And those are the only ones that report it. So, and we all mm -hmm. know not everybody reports those things, right? Yeah, exactly. Sarah Marie's information is down below and um, reach out if you're interested in learning about trauma-informed self-defense. Sarah Marie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Would you like to get the devices from the world's top self-defense experts? If so, go on and get your pass from www.womensselfdefensesummit.com.